Hey everybody, welcome to the Curse of Oak Island and Beyond live stream and Tom Burns, we are here to, uh, this afternoon and we're going to have a great time with our upcoming guest. Tom, everything going all right today? Great, beautiful sunny day in New Brunswick. <laughs> all right, looking good up in New Brunswick. Hey folks, we are uh, excited to have Laird Niven on the show today and uh, we're going to have a great couple, you know, whatever, however much time he has with us to share today talking about all the stuff going on in season nine and past on Oak Island. And we are going to get started with that right now. This is Robert Clotworthy, the narrator of The Curse of Oak Island, and I have a question for you. Could it be that you are listening to The Curse of Oak Island and Beyond live stream? This is a top pocket find, mate, for sure. Hey, all right. Welcome back, everybody. And yes, a top pocket find for sure. Laird Niven, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you, Jeff. Hey, Tom. Hey. Great to have you here, Alert. Thanks for coming. It's great to be here. Oh, That's a man. great introduction, you know, by the way. I'm sorry? The, the intro was really good. Oh, thank you. I like to show all the different scenes of guests that we've had, like yourself, yeah. uh, coming on the show, and you and Steven and stuff like that. And and uh, while we're at it, I'll just go ahead and mention that next Saturday, we have Steve Guptel and Dr. Ian Spooner will be on the show next week. So, yeah, we're looking forward to that one as well. So we can, you know, rib uh, Stephen a little bit. We know we like to. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be able to tell him, hey, Laird told us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Laird yeah. Told us about know this. I've, been, I've been keeping a record of all his sayings. <laughs> I call it um, stuff that Steve Guptel says, except they don't say stuff. Oh, you're using the other word for yeah. the other S word for. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be awesome. Uh, that We're looking forward to that. Yeah, Stephen is, he's a great guy. We yeah. love him a lot, you know, being on the show and on the on the Oak Island and what he does there. We know that he's very professional. Uh, you know, we joke about his makeup trailer, you know, and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But hey, before we get started very far on this, I did want to mention you have a, uh, a cancer um ride that you're doing i think it's called the bmo ride for cancer tell us a little bit about that well that was actually started by uh i'm on a team with eric valois eric has been on the show um he's a surveyor he's worked at the uh mm -hmm. at the wash table driven the skids oh yeah 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 yep. yeah so eric invited me on the show because he knew that i drove my bike back and forth to to the island um and it, we had just lost a good friend uh, from cancer. My wife's had cancer. My sister died of cancer. So it was a, a, 
a cause obviously very close to my heart mm-hmm. and i thought it was a great opportunity to help out so yeah and i just brought up the uh we do have it linked in our uh, description down below of the show today. It's linked there if you uh, would like to check that out. Um, and hit, this is the actual site here for it um, that Laird is doing, which is really a great cause. And we we are all about the great causes, especially the ones that you guys on the island are uh, interested in. And so mm-hmm. we try to you know help out in any way that we can. Um, and I think on here too, that's got the 50, 100 and 150, but a person can basically click in this box here, I think, and put in whatever yeah. they want, right? Yeah, exactly. We've had everything from, from $200 to $10. I mean, it, it all helps. It all yeah. goes towards the cause. So, Absolutely. yeah. So like I said, folks, uh, you can find that out there. It's, um, uh, your ride for cancer.ca fundraise your dot your ride for cancer.ca and you can find it there or just like I said look for the link and I think uh, we'll get it linked in the Facebook site as well actually it's been on our our site and everything too so. I, sh- I should add that I'm kind of trying to uh, incentivize it um, so I started off by offering to auction off my trowel not <laughs> auction it off sorry for every five dollars you get a chance all right. Oh, fantastic. I think we saw a picture of somebody uh, chewing on it or something. That, that was Gary. <laughs> that was uh, one thing I'd never get used to is I, so I left my camera in the research center. And later that night, as I was going through my photographs, I see all these crazy photographs because the crew gets hold of it. And and that's where that came from. That shot came from. Oh, because my, my first question was going to be how many beers did he have at the mug and anchor before he took yeah. that no this was during this was during the day oh wow and i've done the same thing with my phone i left my phone um mm, in the yeah. war room once and came back to some rude pictures by doug and, <laughs> and gary so yeah oh that's hilarious you know, but that, so, that's... gary's gary's offered to sign that photograph so it'll be one of a kind and it'll go along with the trowel oh that's great and then when that's done we're gonna i'm gonna offer other stuff up mm. until october yeah, what I saw, like I said, we uh, we saw on there that uh, right now, and I'll bring that back up just real quick here. Uh, it does say that it's at uh, three thousand. The goal was four thousand, but folks, don't stop there. Really, I mean, you know, don't think, oh well, he's got it's almost there. No, I mean, if it goes well over that, that's a great thing. That's I put it one. up to six. Oh, did you? Okay, yeah. it's up to six now. All right, yeah. that's great. Yeah. So if you can, folks, help out. You know, it's a great cause, and then, like he's like Laird said, every five dollars was it you get a yeah. chance to win that trowel yeah so there you go it's actually used on oak island right this is i that's the trial i've had since season four. Oh my goodness yeah wow it's there you the go. only trial it's got I've miles on it. pardon me it's, it's, it's got, got some, some miles on it, on it. it does. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome all right well that's a good k uh good uh cause and uh of course like you said near and dear to your heart mm-hmm. for sure um unfortunately yeah 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 yeah, very true. Be pretty hard pressed to find somebody whose family has not been touched by cancer. Exactly. Uh, my father. Yeah. My dad. My father. Yeah. yeah. My dad had lung cancer real bad. So, yeah, yeah it took his life. Yep. Yeah. So, you're right. And it is a good cause. And I just hope that someday we do get to a cure on this thing and uh, find our way through that for sure. Um, save a lot of lives in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, going back, a lot of the folks that have uh, watched our shows, uh, and they've some of you know, we have the you've been on the show before, and again, thank you so much for that. No, no problem. Um, and so, as we normally, we always go back and talk about your past and your history and everything. I don't want to go all the way back to what got you started, but what I did want to ask about getting on Oak Island. Now, everybody you know that watches the show, most everyone says, Okay, you came on, what was it, season four? four? Okay. Yeah. And that's where you started. But yeah. actually you were on Oak Island long before that. You were actually working with uh the two uh gentlemen, Dan and Fred back then. Tell us a little bit about I, that. I was working for a company called Jake's Whitford and mm-hmm. and they got the contract to do an archaeological assessment of Dan Blankenship's properties on Oak Island. Wow. That's when the the Treasure Trove Act switched over to the Oak Island Act. So it was 2008, I think. Um, so yeah, no, I came on the island uh, with a with a helper. Um, we surveyed the island, talked to Dan. Um, 
made note of the of the ball property I actually did a little bit of testing on the ball property and uh, the McGinnis foundation we knew about recorded those I think we were two days or something like that and we went and went to report to Dan and uh, I remember he said we're all, I said we're all done we're all ready to leave and he said well I thought you'd be here a lot longer than that <laughs> and I thought well there's a missed opportunity but yeah, yeah. <laughs> But he was really good, obviously knowledgeable about the island. Um, and then the next year, I got a call from Fred Nolan um, to do the same on his property oh, wow. for the same reason. Mm -hmm. He was still treasure hunting. But Fred, I had to meet Fred. Fred at the time had his museum at the head of the start of the causeway. Mm -hmm. So because Fred and Dan were not getting along, we had to walk along the causeway and then along the shore mm. until we got to center road and then walk to Fred's property because we weren't allowed on any of Dan's property. Yeah. Wow. But Fred was great too. I mean, it, it all went really well. Was that, was that kind of an awkward thing for you to be like being in the middle of that, knowing that that's, I mean, how much did you know about the, the few? Nothing. You were having? Nothing. No, that was the, I, I learned about it as we were walking. So that that's that's how I learned about it. Wow. And the other interesting fact is I've actually been on lot five too. Oh wow. The uh, young property. Robert Young called me to come. And the only way you can access lot five is by boat. So he he drove me, and my son, and his friend over. Wow. So we could take a look on lot five. Wow. What was that like? It was pretty cool. He's a pretty fastidious guy. He had a, all his oaks had numbers on them and uh the, the lot's pristine. It's all cleared out. And yeah, but Dan had, Dan had, uh, had cut down a 10 foot barrier around, not a barrier, a clearing mm -hmm. around the lot. So he could make sure that Robert Young didn't come onto his property at all. Oh boy. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can see that in the aerial photographs. You'll see this big cut around. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think I have seen that now, yeah. to, now that you mention it. Oh, I never knew what that was all about. Wow, yeah. that's that's interesting. Yeah. You know, that would have made tensions a little high, obviously. Now you you were working with Dan and now you're working with Fred and yeah, yeah that's um, you know, you, you mentioned the ball property, and that's one of the areas that I know is dear and near and dear to our heart. Um yeah. also for Tom. Um mm -hmm. and you know, you you shared obviously you shared that video. Uh that was wonderful. And you shared on you. That was on your uh, Oak Island archaeology site, right? I, I tried to put it on both, possibly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the yeah, 3D so. model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I want to show this real quick before we get too far in as well. This is Laird's uh, Facebook page. Um, it's uh, Oak Island archaeology. Um, so you can go there and check it out. It's also linked in the description below if you want to go out and check on that and follow because Laird shares a lot of wonderful stuff. Uh, on this page that, um, you know, like that, like the video uh, of this of ball property and all that uh, really good stuff. There's the trowel. Yeah. Um, so and yeah, go out there. If, you, if, if you scroll down a long ways too, you get some fantastic pictures of the, yeah, uh, when, when you were doing Smith's Cove as well too. Yes. Yeah. That was what the, the what I initially um, posted. Yeah. So if, any, if anybody new wants to see what, what they did down in Smith's Cove, Scroll down through till you find it, and there's some amazing yeah. pictures in there. Yeah, look at this stuff. This is a great, great. So that's my work in Birchtown. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Great stuff. This is really, really neat. So, like I said, folks, you're going to miss out if you don't check this uh, Facebook page out and click follow on there with Laird, and he will share a lot of really interesting things with you. Not just about Oak Island, but a lot. That's that's one of the things that really fascinates me too. Is that there's so much that you have done that is not Oak Island related, but yet Ooh. really, really cool for the entire area. Yeah. Like you, you venture, well, tell us about maybe if you will, before we get to Sam Ball property, uh, share yeah. with us anything else that is going on in the area that might be of interest to us as far as archeology span is concerned. Oh, in the area. Um, well, I've been kind of out of the time. I've been concentrating just on Oak Island. Mm -hmm. um, since season four, basically. <laughs> Full-time job, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of great work. Uh, St. Mary's is doing great work in Grand Prix 
looking at the Acadians and the expulsion of the Acadians. Mm -hmm. uh, that's some, some pretty cool stuff. Uh, a lot of technology, you know, a lot of uh, uh, drone-based LIDAR and uh, ground-penetrating radar and things like that is going on in the province uh, mm -hmm. as well. Mm. Yeah. But no, no large-scale archaeology. A lot of it's, um, you know, like, developments and and uh roads and highways and things like that right tom i know you had some questions about uh sam ball property well, what, yeah what sam, sam ball's always been a bit of a curiosity to me i mean people say he was a wealthy man well you know wealthy is a relative term right i mean wealthy in terms of land you own wealthy in terms of money in the bank gold in the bucket you know whatever yeah well so i was curious to get your thoughts on it the foundation the ball foundation now that would have been a stone foundation Mm -hmm. with a wood with a wood floor yeah now would other foundations of that time be similar or would his be sort of the upper end type of house or uh, compared to other things in the area one of the things we actually had an artist recreate his house or as best she could last year i don't think it made the show um i'm gonna ask her for permission to share her renderings that'd be neat um so it comes out looking like an average house really uh, the cellar itself uh, was fairly deep, uh, I think probably four feet. You know, it was a decent sized, a decent sized cellar. Wow. Um, it had a central fireplace, but at some point it was freestanding. And at some point the back end, the north end got closed in. Hmm. If you look at some of the pictures, you can see that the construction's different. So he may have expanded it. It may have been a rectangular house and it may have expanded into an L shaped house, which is what it is now. And that, that L shape we're quite sure is the kitchen just based okay. on the artifacts that we've been finding. So nothing in the house is, um, speaks of anything extraordinary in terms of, uh, of, of money. Mm -hmm. So you can see, I don't know if you can see, so that's South at the top. Okay, so this is south up here. Okay, that's south up here. So you see the the freestanding the the base of the fireplace, the hearth. Yeah. So just if you just down below, if you bring your cursor down, mm -hmm. oh, I'll bring it up, 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 down, right, just no, down a little bit, there, right there. Mm -hmm. You can see the cut stone, and you can see, and and then behind that to the north, it's more like rubble. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. I what you're saying. Yep. yeah. So that's one of the mysteries that we're trying to figure out. Wow. And you said this was about four feet deep. And I think we remember that from watching it on the show when you guys yeah. were in there. You were in there with Liz and you were at going yeah. at it. Yeah, exactly. Going at it. You're really getting all this stuff in, you know, the information. There was like a, it was it a wood floor? Is that what was discovered? You were found yeah. at one point. If you look at the top of the hearth, uh so this go go uh south at the yeah. south edge of the hearth see that just that's that black stuff in the bottom there is burning oh right here that's burnt okay. floor okay yeah wow yeah was yeah, there any other structures right in that general area there that they would have had like i don't know a smokehouse or whatever there is what was we thought was his barn see the problem is so Samuel Ball died in 1842, um, and in his will, he said Isaac Butler would inherit the house, the property, if he took the Ball name. Um, and it appears that Isaac Butler stayed there until the end of the 19th century, so almost into the 20th century, but he never did change his name. No. Oh. So there's a barn there, we think, but I think it's probably it's not a Samuel Ball barn. It's probably later yeah, than that wow. okay. so we have is we have is the two walls and we have a well and a small well at the freshwater pond as well as well a small well at the freshwater <laughs> pond uh, and those are the only structures we found okay wow. now he owned for the outhouse now samuel owned the total of nine lots on yeah. oak island so and i mean that's one of the first ones he bought obviously rebuilt his house yeah, that, that's like twenty eight percent of the island that the that the guy owned. Yeah, right. Like, did he use all of those, or do you know if, if or suspected he used all those for for farming, or maybe some for a woodlot, maybe some for grazing? Like, has it ever been determined 
yeah. how much of those nine lots you actually use for farming? Yeah, we teamed up with Aaron Helton last year, so season eight. Mm -hmm. um, and she determined it was about probably up to seven and a half acres that could have been cultivated. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, and at some point, I don't have the statistics here. At some point, I figured out how many cabbages you could you could grow and stuff. We uh, we actually have no evidence. I haven't seen any evidence that he was a cabbage farmer. Ah, okay. Um, there's no documentation, nor have I seen any documentation that he was a blacksmith. Um, if we use if we use seven acres for any type of cultivation, it might not all have been cabbage either. Yeah, exactly. And seven acres, he owned a total of uh, well nine. Like he would have owned a total of 36 acres. So he didn't use no. the majority of his own land for farming. Yeah. And there's something going on in lot 30 that we haven't figured out yet. Oh, wow. So that might be a target, a target for this year. Hmm. So we figured, uh, you know, I guess he could have sold cabbage or cabbage and or a sauerkraut to the Royal Navy. Mm -hmm. Um, but we haven't found any records to confirm that. Right. Um, if you go down there and you look at the land and you look at, he's got two, two stone walls. So separating lot 24 and 25 and 25 and 26 that are six feet wide, three feet high and a thousand feet long. So just the construction wow. of the walls. That's a lot of rocks. That That's is. A lot of rocks. <laughs> so he didn't have a lot of free time. No. <laughs> uh, he was, I know. I know that uh, Tom, being from uh, New Brunswick, has told me that um, you know you guys grow rocks, you guys harvest rocks up there. You know, <laughs> oh, <laughs> anywhere, <that's> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Anywhere they dig, you know, they're running. And you see that when you go out with um, with um, you know Gary doing metal detecting or whatever. As soon as they hit the ground, they're either hitting roots or rocks, one yeah. or the other. Everywhere they go, so yeah. it's, it's uh, uh, not a shortage of rocks to be had. And of course, we you know we talked about on the show before how they. Many of the times they use these rocks, not only like a foundation for his home, but also as property lines, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They're, 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 that's quite common. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, clear quite a lot. we see that quite a lot here. Even like over on my camp, which is on what we call the Kingston Peninsula, so there's a lot of old farmlands that have been there since the days of the Loyalists. Yeah. And they're all divided by, you know, they pick the rocks, whether it was for a field or a pasture or yeah. a, a garden. The rocks had to come off the field and they just I've, put them down the property line. I've done a lot of work in Birchtown, which is, uh, I don't know, an hour and a half away from Oak Island. And um, there are a lot of huge brick uh, stone walls, but also uh, uh, like stone rock features, like large stone rock features that are, I'll have to try to highlight um, because they're really unusual. They're really strange. I've never seen anything like it before. Uh, no idea why they were created. And they weren't land clearing because they all occupy spots on the land. So uh, field clearing, you tend to find the rocks would be at the edge of the field, right? Where yeah. Not. Yeah. I've seen a few up here that actually put the rocks in the middle of the field for whatever reason. But Okay. I guess they had a big but, pile. Like. <laughs> yeah, the big pile. Like they just, <laughs> it's well, that's a, the closest but, yeah, point, I guess. From, yeah. Wherever they were going to yeah. dump them, I guess that's where yeah. they decided on. But, yeah. But, but uh, Samuel Ball... You know, he, he we didn't really do any we didn't do any work with Samuel Ball last year. Uh, yeah, I know that was we were uh, looking forward to that too. I was anyway because that's one of the subjects that you know obviously everybody talks about. How did he become so wealthy? Did he find something? And that's everybody wants to know. Or was he selling golden cabbages? You know, if if that whole cabbage story is true, and that's what he was doing, you know, there's the wharf that goes out. Yeah. I guess two actually from his properties now. Did he put those in? Did somebody else put those in prior to him buying the property? I don't know. Has that been determined? Do you know at all? Or no? Okay. No, I, I think we're hoping to get to work on that side of the property in the future. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So you would think that if a boat's, you know, if he was supplying because vitamin C, right, uh, scurvy and everything yeah. else, the guys would need it. I, even though I can't stand sauerkraut. I said it again on the show, but you know, there's a, you know, that is something that would have been beneficial to the ships when they're going back across um, that they need to have on board. So it makes sense that he would, if he was doing cabbages, yeah, he was taking them out to the, that pier would be there for them to get on. The other, the, the other issue is, is 
the Tan Cook Islands. So we can see the Tan Cook Islands from Oak Island, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what they produce. They produce sauerkraut. I mean, that's what they're famous for. Wow. <laughs> but cabbages weren't introduced to, to the area until about 1808, I think. Mm -hmm. so that, quite, a, quite a time afterwards then. Yeah. yeah. Like that kind yeah. of. It's amazing what you what you when you start to and this is what archaeology is about, right? Yeah, exactly. You don't accept opinion. We have to look at these things and yeah, and uh, that's why people tend not to like archaeologists all the time because we we tend to find out the truth. <laughs> yeah, you know, lipstick capes, yeah. covers, things like that. You yeah. know, I mean, rubs. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> But Tom, Tom had an interesting question relating to uh, archae when you have more than one archaeologist working on a particular area. Tom, what was that? Yeah, I'm just curious. When we go to when you go to catalog items, if yeah. we have two or more archaeologists on a site, and you, I don't want to say get into a disagreement, but you have one thought on what something might be, and somebody has another thought on what it might be. When you go to catalog these things, how is the decision made? For the purposes of someone that down the road wants to look something up or do some research, find it. Like, how is the, the cataloging process work? Who wins? I guess. Yeah. You say it's the well, I think you guys never had that. I've, <laughs> I've had things. I've had to go correct catalogs mm. recently because I'm not the one cataloging. I'd like to be. There's mm. not enough time. Um, we tend to have a drop down menu of of choices. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's kind of standardized that way. Okay. But it's, it's the permit holding archaeologist is the one who gets gets the final say. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because we were one talking more about the question on, on, I'm sorry, on, go ahead, on Samuel Ball. Yeah. He bought yeah. what was called Hook Island, now Sam's Island. Hmm. It was the third piece of land he actually acquired. Any but he ever even any thought to what he was doing over there? Or done any poking there's around? Been, there's been lots of talk about about getting out there. I don't. I actually don't know who owns it. To be mm. very honest, no. Um, I, he also had a hundred acres on the mainland yep. as well. Mm. Yep. Uh, um, and we think maybe, it, perhaps, there's some talk about perhaps his son had settled on there. Okay. Um, but no, we don't know. We don't know. I mean, Samuel Ball. We kind of have good records until he comes to Nova Scotia, and then. Uh, he's supposed to have been in Shelburne, but we don't we don't have any we just have his word for that. We don't have any record that he was actually there. It's almost like he becomes a man of mystery because there's no pictures, photos, paintings. No. No. I, I think his I think he's on Oak Island because either Donald McGinnis or Danny McGinnis or he, he's there with other people that he met during the Revolutionary War. I think. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, they all seem to come there around the same time. Yeah. Yeah. That was the interesting point, too, is that, you know, we had looked into certain paper. Uh, there was a couple of published papers put out about the, the finding of the money pit. Mm -hmm. One of them came out and said that Samuel Ball was one of the three that found it. And then the next one comes out. He's removed. And I think it was Smith was put on or Vaughn was put on. Yeah, that's Des uh history of Lunenburg County. Wow. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So that, was he or was he not part of that? You know, that's a really telling piece, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because he, you know, oh, I don't want to be associated with what we found there. Take my name off that, and you know, put somebody else's name on. Because he owned property when in 1795, right when it was found. Oh, yeah, so he was obviously there. Yeah, you know, I, you know, Prometheus. I know when they go through the show, they're like, "Oh, these three boys came over to an uninhabited island." It's like, no, no, the people <laughs> don't know that anybody was living there, but. Yeah, and he purchased lot twenty five, which his first one was seventeen eighty seven. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so you know, he was he, he was not the new kid on the block. No, no. and the artifacts we were finding support that kind of date for him being there. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, and then you figure, okay, well, then he became very wealthy. Did they find something or not? You know, so that's always that question left it hanging out there. That you know, did I mean, is he involved, you know. The archaeological, well, the archaeological record shows that he was, you know, um, like lower middle class, maybe. Mm -hmm. At least that's how he'd live. But that doesn't necessarily mean he, exactly. he didn't I have saw, more. It's I just, saw that a lot through my career. People who were wealthy didn't obviously, you know, live display it. Yeah. 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 We just had a taxi driver die. I didn't know him, but he donated 1.8 
nine million dollars to uh, to a, a, a cause, right? Wow! So you never you. know who you're talking to. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's for sure. So, okay, so is that pretty much what you had for uh, Samuel Bow? For Samuel, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we can yeah. save the rest for another time, maybe. But he yeah. was an interesting guy. He really was. And I found him fascinating the whole time. Yep. That's why yeah. I'd like to see you get back to that ball foundation. Oh, yeah. around some more. So would I. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who do I have to call here? Do I, yeah, who do I have right. to call? <laughs> You're call the guy Marty. in charge. He already wants to build a house there. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. So, you know, when it comes to, you know, let's, let's, let's dive into that a little bit. You know, the whole permitting process. And we do have some questions that a lot of the people, we will get to these folks. I do have your list of questions <laughs> that were submitted. Um, and some of these we may touch on as we go along here. Um, but talking about the, the, the permitting process now. Um, well, I tell you before, actually, before we get to that, let's step back a little bit to the Southeast corner of the swamp and the finding yeah. of the uh, Mi'kmaq artifacts. Um, this is a subject that we've talked about on the show and we support uh, what you and and I, honestly, what you went through during that whole process had to be painstaking mm -hmm. to be able to bring all that up. I mean, the, we had one slide with a look on your face when you were presenting this all to them in the war room. Yeah. Um, and how that must have felt, how you felt about all that. But you know, we've talked about the fact on the show that 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 you know, it's it's part of history, and yet you have to be very careful with that. Now, you found some stuff in the southeast corner of the swamp, but we know there were some other areas that were kind of cordoned off. Tell us a little bit about that. So southeast corner, for sure, where you found it was shown on the TV show. Yeah. So there was also another area as well, right? Yeah. There's an area we picked up from last year, uh, from season eight, where Rick was working uh, in the northeast corner of the swamp, mm -hmm. where they were finding historic artifacts. Okay. And he thought it was a midden. So it became known as Rick's midden. Um, and so we started our work last year there um, to look for a continuation of the midden. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we found a couple of stone flakes. And then we found more and more. Uh, we found enough where we had to report it. Right. Right. And that, that's what we're obliged to report it. Yep. Um, and I think it's, we weren't allowed to continue. We had to stop. Um, and we, we weren't able to get back. But what we did conclude is there's a large flat rock, um, you know, like this there. Right. And and the edge of and underneath the rock, were these tiny rock flakes, we call them micro flakes. Mm -hmm. And so when they're, when they're finishing their, their arrowheads or bifaces, as we call them, they're doing the final finishing. They're taking off these little tiny flakes. Mm -hmm. So that rock is where somebody 3,000 years ago sat and finished his tools. Wow. Probably for whatever they were hunting in the swamp. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. So it's something that Helen and I had never seen before. 40 years of archaeology, we'd never seen it before. Wow. So that was, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Somebody asked the question, what were the flakes made of? What Do you know what they were? There were a lot of quartz. Okay. And then there's a, a an agate or a, a, a chalcedony that comes from the other side of the province, from the Bay of Fundy. Oh wow! Um, yeah, that that's uh, that was the other material that we found. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would, would the suspicion be that that was a, like a seasonal hunting site, maybe? Yeah, I think so because there's no. There are probably a lot of deer on there, so the deer were easy to round up. Um, they could have been going after wild like ducks and geese, or they could be driving the deer into the, into the swamp. Yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. Like, he's just that much easier for them to kill. Yep. Um, yeah. So that's what we suspect. There's no fresh water. There's no source of fresh water on Oak Island. And that's what I was going to ask you if there were any other wells or sources on there. Like, no, like we can't, we don't have any potable water, even in the interpretive center or, you know, wow. you have to drink bottled water because I know where I stayed last year, the water's very sulfury. It's very, it's not <laughs> pleasant water to drink. <laughs> yeah. So, so while there may not be channels necessarily out to the open ocean, it's, there's ground seepage there then of yeah. some sort from, from the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my assumption is that they were there seasonally. 
we don't know for how long because we weren't allowed to delineate the sites. Mm -hmm. um, Ian Spooner thinks they were trading there. I don't think we found any evidence of that. There was uh, one of the uh, the folks that were um, that put up some questions, and I was just trying to find it here. I remember what the question was about, um, but I wanted to recognize them real quick. But while you're answering this, I'll try to figure out. <laughs> remember who that was, but it had to do with the, um, the the Mi'kmaq, and of course, you know, we saw on the episodes last season mm -hmm. that because the artifacts were found, that those areas were shut down for you know searching for treasure or whatever. Um, and, and again, we kind of mentioned to the fact that that this was actually, in a way, even though it got shut, the certain areas got shut down, it was actually a good thing because if you could work with the folks, the representatives of the First Nations people, and maybe get more information about who was there, the who, what, why, when, you know, be, with yeah. their, because they would have known anybody that came yeah. around there, you know, coming in in a ship, their First Nation people are going to know. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe there's some where areas there to to collaborate on that. But has the has anyone from First Nations people have been out there, a representative to come out and see what's going on with all of these sites? They've been there. They've been there to see the sites. Okay. Um, not not in a research mode. Right. Right yet. Um, I mean, the, it wasn't unexpected to find these. No, I, uh, I was expecting to find them. Find yeah. them right, right. Um, I mean, the problem's complicated because it's a TV show. Yeah. Right. Yep. Oh, I should point out though, the province will say we were not shut down. Ah. Okay. It was. It was suggested. Ah. Well. They didn't, they didn't force us. Mm -hmm. They suggest we do it. <laughs> That's another word for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so one of the things we're dealing with is is the fact that this is a TV show. There are uh, much more important sites are in Nova Scotia than what we found on Oak Island. But I think it's recognized that this is a way for, and I support this, for the Mi'kmaq to tell their story yes. to a broader audience. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So, and we're, we're all about working together with them. Yeah. And that's a, one of the great things about Rick and Marty. You know, yes, it was frustrating that what what had happened, but they have been trying from the very start to do things correctly. Yes. And and I think that that just be that's um you know their their integrity shows through. Um, and having you come on on board to be able to make sure that you're because you're like a representative between them and the government, correct? so to speak, or, or do you work directly for them now? I work directly for them. Okay. All right. Yeah. I just work under permit from the government. Okay. All right. Yeah. From I knew there was the some yeah, Which has obviously some certain responsibilities that yeah. you don't live up to them. Your permit is going to get yanked, right? So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah right. Exactly. Yeah. That was Sherry, uh, Sherry Dugan that asked that question about the First Nations people. So um, thanks for submitting that, Sherry. Appreciate it. Um, so knowing that, you know, you're going back to the whole permit process. So mm -hmm. uh, Linda was asking a couple of the questions having to do, Linda, our uh, admin mm -hmm. of our group, um, is it hard to get the permits now uh, compared to, you know, like past years? Our, we work under what, so there's a, in the province, there's a category A permit, a B permit, and a C permit. Right. That was my next lead in on that too, was the different types of permits. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. And we used to work under category B, which is a general research permit, which means you didn't pay for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, each permit costs $115, I think. So province isn't making a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. um, for whatever reason, in season eight, there were certain things that happened that the Mi'kmaq obviously didn't like. Province felt some heat. So they created what they call a category E uh, blanket permit. Okay. So we were the only place in the province working under this category E permit, oh. uh, which became really complicated. We're working on it. We're, we're, we're going to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we were working on it completely. So this was the first year it was ever done in the province. And it meant a lot of work for me, a lot of, especially afterward, like I just finished. Wow. Uh, that was one of the questions I had for you was, was we see the TV season, but what is Laird Nevin's season like? 
Yeah. <laughs> well, I thought I was going to be so organized. I was paid up until December 24th, but it took a couple of weeks off. But then I've worked the whole winter <laughs> without pay and with no breaks. So, oh, wow. Yeah. I spent the last week just, we're doing a deep clean in the house. So. Oh, you finally got a chance. Yeah. Yeah. I see you're in. Uh, so that's your garage, you said? Yeah. The newly renovated garage. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Is that an air conditioner? About You don't need air conditioning in Nova Scotia. No, no, no. It's a heat pump. Oh, okay. I was going to say, is that one of those walls? It, it will act as an air conditioner. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I won't yeah. be here for it, probably. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the permitting. So the, you know, this is, this is archaeology, right? This is the field work. And then this is the reporting. It's, it's mm. that, a pyramid. So there was a lot to report this year. Yeah. Wow. So when they, when they're digging up, let's say on lot eight, re, the recent shows have shown yeah. area metal detecting on lot eight, they found the famous musket lock yeah. part piece, whatever. Yeah. Well, what's the process like from, from, I guess, start to finish. So we want to go metal detect on lot eight. We think there's something up there we want to look for. Yep. Where so, does Laird become involved in that process? The, the only way I thought they would accept, because they hate metal detectors here, right? It's, right. It's, it's, it's illegal, but it's kind of been grandfathered into Oak Island. So what we did is we, we put one of the things that Eric, who's behind the, the ride for cancer, uh, we put in stakes. We, we put in transects, so lines across the whole um, of the island. That, so Gary could stay within certain areas. So Gary was allowed to go out to wherever he wanted. Um, and he, he knows he's in between this post and this post. Um, and he can go, if he, if he finds something like the flintlock lock plate, uh, a flag goes down, the artifact gets, uh, the information gets reported on the, on the bag. Uh, it comes in, Steve Guptel comes out, uh, records the location of the uh, mm -hmm. of the musket uh, of the flintlock, and I go out and record the soil. I and mean, that's how it worked last year. Okay, so he's well, allowed we, to go out and get hits. He puts a flag in, and then we notice that he comes back later with someone to before they actually dig. Is there something that has to be okayed before he can actually go dig after he finds the initial hit? No, he likes to go out. Um, oh. He likes to go out on his own when he has time off camera. Mm -hmm. He'll go out and he'll flag. Okay, all right. Yeah. I was wondering if there was a process of permitting in between there that had to be done. So that's interesting. well because that so the metal detecting was all under that blanket permit. Okay. Yeah, it was a right. kind of a separate, like a sub permit under the blanket permit. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if, if he gets out there and the artifact that he he's digging for, and it's say they dig down six inches or eight inches or ten inches. Yeah. It's not there, and he's still getting a hit. Is there a limit where he has to stop? No. No, he can. Yeah, he can dig down. the The majority are right, like you said, eight to ten inches. Yeah. So, well, yeah. we saw that part on on lot eight where they went out, and he he went out first with the metal detector. Yeah. And then they they scanned it with that. Oh my gosh, and I'm at a loss. The OKM. Yeah, the handheld that they go yeah. over that Paul Troutman was in that area, yeah. and he was going across that area. And then they had some hits, and they were went out, but they were only allowed to go down to the first hit, which was like five feet down or four feet down or something like that. But there was another one that was like 20 feet down, but apparently now, again, it's TV, so we don't know for sure. But right. were they limited to that first five feet? They weren't allowed to go deeper? No. Okay. No, because everything, the most sense for archaeology, mm -hmm. everything happens in the first, I don't know, 20 inches. Yeah, that's true. Right? So mm -hmm. after that, it's geology, and that's what we figure – Oh, okay. We, Paul's just learning that technology. We're kind of hoping to uh, to uh, streamline it a bit this year, but most of those hits tend to tended to be geology. Okay. Some, yeah. You know, one of the things that we talked about you the the finding the musket um, flintlock yeah um, part that was found, um, and that was that was you know I I don't we have no idea because we know that they take pieces of the show. That might have been early on in the season and they put it later on and they right. moved things like that around so we don't know for sure when it was found but it looked like it was toward the end it was and they, and they found that and brought it to you and they were excited i mean they brought it into the uh into the center there yeah and you you get to play with this new piece of what is a sky 
sky scan ct scanner it's, or something. it's a 1273 ct yeah yeah yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah it was uh so that's what i did most of my summer oh really was sat at that yeah yeah so it's a they call it an x-ray microscope mm -hmm. i guess um but it's essentially it's an x-ray machine on the on the very surface mm -hmm. but then it uh it it scans things like you know things rotate and go up and down and it slices it into tiny 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 slices right and then that all gets reconstructed with software into a three-dimensional image and then uh you can manipulate that software and take away the less dense material so if something's covered in rust and say there's a bell inside mm -hmm. we can take that rust away and see the denser part the denser bell mm -hmm. inside and then we can look and and then we can cut slices through it which is what we did with the with the lock plate yeah tell us about that find i mean what do you think about that thing i think it's pretty cool yeah um not surprising uh, i i I don't know if they're doing it. I don't watch this show, so I don't know what's. Uh, I know the CT scanner's been on. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you had to we, be trained on how we, to use it, right? Yeah, yeah, we got to see your cutaway view of the of the yeah. flint mechanism, yeah, the lock. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's pretty cool. I mean, it, like you can see Gary being excited because you don't, you just don't find these. No, right. very often at all in archaeological sites. Yeah, this then, is. Uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm gonna. Well, then they have the ability to to just up and take it to the CT scanner. Oh well, yeah, is pretty. Oh, cool. it's must be a. Uh, I'm gonna guess a, a pretty continuous stream of people saying, "Laird, look at this. Go look at it." No, no, not yet. I I did get uh, somebody asking about artifacts from uh, William Phipps. Uh, yes. Oh, site. that's interesting. Cool. How about looking at some artifacts for him? Yeah. Wow, uh, really cool. We haven't the the word we haven't put the word out generally. Um, we've told the province that they're welcome, but they we haven't had a positive response from them. And so the, the, the general archaeological community doesn't know that it's there. Wow, but the I mean, permit processing gets a little smoother too, as far as being able to dig where you want to. Yeah, your volumes will go up. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I've looked at a lot of lumpy things this year. <laughs> so. Well, you had mentioned that, but because of this, uh, in the pre-show, we kind of talked about this briefly, but because of this machine and some of the things you're doing, you have like the most sophisticated site now or, or, or center. We will have, we will have like the most advanced archaeology lab in, in the Atlantic provinces. Wow. Without a doubt. Yeah. Wow. That's and open deep. to open to the public, basically. Wow. You know, Very I mean, cool. I mean, I could go down right now and I can sit in front of a three hundred thousand dollar CT scanner and scan whatever I want, which is just unheard of. Oh yeah. No one else, no one else in the country, I think. Yeah. Well, somebody else is going to have to send it away and wait for results, right? And you guys yeah. can find out now. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. Right there. That is the beauty of it. Yeah, I was. Uh, I grabbed a couple because, we, of course, we recap every episode of The mm -hmm. Curse of Oak Island. Oh, yeah. We were talking. Of course, this was Gary's face when they found that. You know, he was so elated, you know. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, he brought it to you um, <laughs> so that you could uh, take a look at it. And, uh, yeah, that's the machine back here in the corner. Yeah. And that was the, you know, the, the dried up, muddy, uh -huh. uh, encrusted piece. That looked really cool and of course that was you putting it in the machine yeah. and ready to go the first image and then of course the yeah. images that you uh and this is what they showed us just last week uh, yeah. on the show and it was uh you know to us at least to me i was fascinated this was like okay now we got something that's really 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 interesting here uh is it now i, I assume that we're going to look into getting some dating on this there was the one picture you had, the very last one, yeah, that showed the holes in it. Yeah. To try to figure out what time period this is from and who. Yeah. If that hasn't been on the show, I can't say no, anything. I know. I no, understand no. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what you, do, what you do learn is how many different varieties of lock plates there are out there. Oh, for sure, right? We know it's a flintlock. That's, yeah. that's for sure. So, yeah. 
Yeah, they haven't told us yet. We're waiting to see that. And I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't want you to get down that road because yeah, they have not they, told us yet. Yeah, uh, but you just see the ability to 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 section those things off and look inside. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, that's Star Trek material. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty very cool. true. That is, it's really interesting. And and for you to be able to sit and use this thing, like you said, pretty much whenever you want to. In 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 yeah. in, in you know before it was oh we found something really cool. Now we got to send it off somewhere to have it looked at. It might take weeks, might take a month, who knows, yeah. you know, before you actually get some information back. They had the XRF scanner, the gun, yeah. uh, for a while. And I don't know if that's still there or not, but now you have this. And this is so yeah. cool. And I'll tell you the really neat thing. So it's non destructive testing, right? It, mm-hmm. nothing, it just gets put in there and, and, and nothing physical happens to that. I just sent that off for, for uh, conservation. It's going to take a year. Oh wow! To conserve that. Right? Wow. So we can gather all that data, and 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 you could actually create a three D model based on that. Wow. Uh, so you could have the artifact in front of you, um, and then have it go off to con- conservation. You don't have to. It doesn't have to be at hand. Right. So that's the really valuable part of of that machine. Truly. So have, have you been going back through artifacts you've had for a number of years or are they all sort of offsite? Uh, a lot of them are offsite. A lot of the, all of the non money pit stuff was, has had to go back to the province. Um, hmm. So I've been doing money, some money pit stuff. I was down a couple of weeks ago and I was sitting there. I actually scanned my phone just to see what it would look like. But... <laughs> so have, you, have, you, have you come across anything where you've scanned it and you go, Whoa, that's not what I was looking for, not what I was expecting. Um, that you can talk that? about? <laughs> yeah, that you're like. I can tell you. I can tell you right now. If we find something like that, kind of, it's a nut. We can pick <laughs> that out right away. Um, any surprises? Tony brought me back some. Brought something in that he'd found, um, which was just a lump. And we scanned that, and it was um, it was onyx jewelry. So you could see that it was a, a like a, an onyx pendant from the mm-hmm. from the Victorian era. Uh, other than that, we can. I mean, we've seen things that we thought were a certain type of like a, a hand wrought nail. We found out was machine cut. So later, okay. um, trying really- to remember, I scanned a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. But really, though, it's, it's, okay. it's going to enable you to rule stuff in, rule stuff out, right? Right. Yeah. 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 And the initial scan is when you get just, you can tell that's just the x-ray before you, uh, you know, kind of when you're setting everything up and the x-ray comes out, that can actually tell you a whole bunch right then and can save you a lot of time. That way you don't have, you know, if it's nothing significant, then you don't continue the scan. Right. Yeah. yeah, Linda did remind me that on the show they did ask you about whether or not the flintlock piece was British, uh, and you said you didn't think it was, and that it could be Spanish or. And then, and then Gary said, "Or it's Portuguese," and you said, "Yeah, you know, it, possible." That's that's as far as it got on the show. Was that right there? That's all we know. All right. <laughs> so uh, we're we're waiting <laughs> okay. to find out. Well, hopefully, I'll, we'll I'll reserve. Out. I'll reserve next comment. Comment. Yep. Next topic. <laughs> yep, next topic, uh, which is this. And this was Jan. You got to meet Jan uh, early uh, before we, uh, Jan Anderson. Um, and she asked, if you could uh, do an arc, arc, okay, if you could do a search, <laughs> archaeological search on any area of the island that has not yet been searched, where would you search and why? I'm still in, well, it'd be nice to get on lot five. Oh yeah, yeah. Young As puppy. we know, he recovered artifacts from Lot Five. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm still intrigued by Lot Twenty Four, mm. like the shore side of Lot Twenty Four, Twenty Five. Mm-hmm. I, I think um, something, and and of course, Twenty Three, which is Dan. Yeah, which we're not allowed on his uh, his property, but there was a there is a cellar on. It's a buried cellar now, but there's a cellar on that property. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Very interesting. Cool. 
All right. Well, hopefully uh, you guys get back in season 10. We're assuming there is going to be a season 10 um, that you, <laughs> you guys will uh, um, be uh, out there and be able to do some more of this type of work because that, you know, again, like Rick, um, so many of us, yeah. Would we love to see a, a, a chest of gold be brought up or, you know, a menorah or something like that brought up? Yes, we all would love that very much. But like Rick, I am, I want to know the who, what, why, when, and where. I yeah. want to know who was there, why were they there, and why did they go something so very important to building like the stone road, the stone platform on the north side of Nolan's Peninsula? Mm -hmm. Why did they go through so much trouble to make all this stuff? The Nolan's Cross, you know, and I've said yeah. on the show a couple of times that no one's going to go through the trouble of moving those boulders into place and taking all that getting all that done just so they could say, Oh, look, yeah, look what we created. That was fun. All right. What's next? Let's get something else going. It means something. And yeah. that's why, you know, it's so interesting. Yeah. One of the questions I get frequently is that if you went on any other Island in Mahone Bay, would you see the same thing? I, I always have to say, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. And why, why Oak Island? Why would you why build Oak Island is the big question. Yeah. 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 You know, and, and to build those rock structures, and not use something as simple as cribbing to hold them up or whatever, right? I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah. that's a lot of work for some reason. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The Stone Road is really pretty cool. Um, Wally asked the question about the Prime Minister's visit. Um, Premier. Premier. The Premier, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, the Premier, yes. He had Prime Minister written down here, and that's why I said it, but you're right, the Premier. <laughs> yeah. um, to visit to Oak Island, is there now a greater chance that the archaeology will continue uh, with with him coming out and his wife coming out and making a visit let's just say it didn't hurt okay perfect <laughs> <laughs> very good um yeah, let's see. He, go ahead he, he has the ability to make suggestions too <laughs> yeah well he's a fan right yeah yeah that that was the neat thing about it is knowing that he was yeah um, and he realizes he's an accountant as well so he realizes the economic benefit oh for sure of oak yeah. island yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's see here. I uh, wanted to ask also, there was, uh, oh, um, uh, Shannon Public Cover asked the question. She said, I wonder if Laird has ever done any digs on George's Island in Halifax Harbor. I didn't get involved in a dig. I've been on George's Island with some mm -hmm. Parks Canada people. Um, I've never dug there. It would be nice. <laughs> yeah. And that's that was kind of going along with the question about you know other significant finds or digs you know things. I know that you've been on you. There was matter of fact, I showed when we first had you on uh, the very first time we talked about when you were actually on TV uh, and a, on a newscast, and you yeah. were talking about an archaeology dig that you had done in the city. I think it yeah. was. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Yeah. So obviously, there's other stuff going on, and you've been involved in this for many years. Mm -hmm. um, doing this kind of work. How many years have you been in archaeology now? Uh, 1984. Wow. 1983 I actually started, yeah. So wow. that's, it's getting close to 40 years. Um, Barbara Duncan asked a question. How many layers layers uh, of inhabitants do you think there have been on Oak Island? Well, if I think about the southeast corner, I have to think about this because we weren't there for long. Um, so we have the natural accumulation. So after we call it post abandonment accumulation. Um, and then we have some kind of more or less searcher related, mm -hmm. you know, fill that's been brought in the done field yeah. kind of things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, and then we hit um, the early searcher layers, um, which we can tell by the ceramics and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in the southeast corner of the swamp, then below that, we were, we were hitting the Mi'kmaq occupation layer. Mm -hmm. But Samuel Ball, if you look at the Samuel Ball site, we just have the A horizon, which is the accumulation of, of leaves and things like that. Uh, and then a, a, the B horizon, which is where the occupants, where, where, where the Samuel Ball artifacts are found. Mm -hmm. you know, very, it's very simple stratigraphy throughout the island. Wow. That's really neat. So, you know, if in, in like we know, you know, and again, I don't live in the area, but watching and, and some of the 
um, talking to some of the researchers from the area and people like Tom and and Colin and and some of the other guests that we've had on the show or co-hosts, you know, have talked about you know the the French being there, the English or the British being there, um, and they're different, you know, pushing each other out over the years and all that. And then of course now it's the big the Portuguese connection mm-hmm. that everybody is so interested in, um, and I think that part is fascinating as well. Truly, I, you know, it's. Uh, if, if the, and, and I guess Tom has told me, yes, the Portuguese were in the area. They, they're, they're well documented that they've been in the area. Yeah. Um, we haven't found anything archaeologically. I'm not sure what we found in the province. I think there was actually a swivel gun in Lewisburg. They thought maybe Portuguese. Um, but we know they were there. The Portuguese mm-hmm. were there early. The Basques were there early. The Norse were, we know the Norse. Right. Were here. We just, just so elusive to try to find them. Um, so I'm good with all those guys, you know, in, in terms of a theory, in terms of the credibility of them being there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It could it's happen. possible. That they, it's, it's logical to assume that they could have been there at some point. Yes. Yep. It's yep. just the archaeologists, need, we need, we need the, the, the hard evidence, right? And the problem is they didn't leave a lot of evidence, right? That's, that's the real. Yeah. The lack. So I think somebody said that last season in season eight, I guess, so that the lack of evidence. I think actually it was um, Miriam had said that the lack of evidence means tells a big story, too. Yeah. 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 For sure. Covering their tracks, I guess, so to speak. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what struck us. It struck Gary and I in Smith's Cove. You know, when they when they put up the coffer net, we thought, you know, there's, there'll be stuff everywhere. And there just wasn't. Yeah. So, so does that lead you to think that it just, biodegradable and maybe it just disintegrated over time or did somebody maybe clean up before they left well that's that's one part yeah it could be that that rather than ceramics the earlier they got the less likely it was that they had ceramics um so what they were eating off we call it treen ware so wood right wooden bowls wooden plates mm-hmm. um and so yeah that would that would just that would just disintegrate or if the people of smith's cove were doing work and they were based on its ships, then their garbage is going over the ship and not yeah. into Smith's Cove. Which right. would explain the use for slipways and things for bringing smaller yeah. craft up and down. Yeah. 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 Um, I've got a question here from Michelle, um, one of our members and viewers. And um, Michelle asked Has there has any archaeology um, research been done uh, on the old sawmill located near the causeway? Would there be any tie to the woodworking tools? Um, who owned the, the mill and its connection to the island? The sawmill that I know of, which is at the start of Center Road, so the west side of Center Road, that's the only sawmill I know of. I think that might be what she's talking about. That, that dates from like the 1930s. Oh, is it? It's What's pretty relatively new. There, yeah. All right. Um, well, they would have... You know, we're quite sure there would have been a blacksmith, at least one blacksmith always. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. a sawmill and, and things like that. But um, we haven't narrowed down those sites. Right. So the, the pine tar kiln, or what do you think? Is it a pine tar kiln or is it something else? Well, there was no evidence of pine tars. <laughs> that's what yeah, I remember that being <laughs> talked about. Yeah. That's that's what led me to my original question on, on how do we categorize, how do we, you know, when people don't see eye to eye on something. So. Yes. Yeah. I, David McGinnis has an interesting uh, approach. He's only, he, he's only, was only doing archeology span for like four years, uh, but he's got a very diverse background. And what he does is he decides, he starts with the premise that this is, this is a pine tar kiln. And then through his work, either proves or disproves it. Where I, I would start off saying right. something yeah no, you're trying to reverse engineer it <laughs> yeah yeah because once you stayed at something especially on tv once you yeah. stayed at something it's really difficult to walk it back right you know, i mean it's an like- interesting thing that there there definitely was something happened there mm-hmm. involving liquid because you could see at one point where something was a liquid was spilled hmm. uh, but we didn't have the means to analyze the soils as if we go back there and take soil samples this year, we'll have a, a much better, we'll be much more able to analyze the soils. Mm-hmm. And from there, 
perhaps say what it was. Right. Yeah, because there was charcoal found, and I don't know that we ever found out if that was dated or not. Um, it was recent. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we were, you know, and a lot of people have come back and, and me included thinking, I don't know, pine tar kiln. Okay. Yeah. We do. They, you know, thinking about the, the, the road in the swamp, go ahead. Were you going to say something? No, no, no. No. So, you know, thinking about it, I thought, well, if you were doing some sort of a ship repair before ships go back over, uh, you know, across the pond, then yes, they would probably need to do some kind of, you know, repairs and pine tar. Yeah. Being very important. So, you know, thinking of that, but then, like you said, the lack of the pine tar being showing up there, what, what, what do you think it is? Did you ever get a, a, I know you need fat. I know you hate to jump into, you've and I've talked about that before. You hate to speculate because let the facts tell you. Yeah. Because <laughs> based on the artifacts, it's, it's from it's from the 1800s okay I think. it's okay. more likely searcher okay but what they were doing there why they needed because we didn't find so we didn't find enough evidence to say they built a fire in here and mm -hmm. right there just wasn't there wasn't that uh that amount of charcoal oh, okay it's so almost like something they could have used for a temporary smoke house or something like that and that's what i'm thinking it was mm -hmm. a temporary thing not a mm -hmm. Like almost a one-off yeah kind of thing again i don't think it was anything at first so. could have been seasonal use for something yeah 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 they need to dig a place to hide something keep something cold i mean yeah yeah exactly yeah. and yeah, we should that, be finding things like that yeah well you know that's going back to the stone road and the the platform that was on the north side of nolan's peninsula uh, and again, thinking about those things being built there, and then now we've we've got the episode to kind of with Corey in and and Rick and everybody going over to uh, Portugal. Portugal and looking yeah. at the road over there. Is the construction similar? Yes. So, you know, if the Romans started that, and then that would get spread to other countries that would learn about it. So you think anybody could have done it, right? Well, it's kind of it's kind of a I don't, the word is zeitgeist. It's the there's only one solution for that problem. Mm. You know what I mean? It's not a, it's not a major technological yeah. revolution. And what you have to realize is the, the stone roads that thick. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not huge. Right. Um, it was well made. And the really neat thing about the stone road is the West side has larger rocks on it. And I think you may remember Steve Guptel, saying that when he's done road surveys, anything on the seaside, you put the larger oh, rocks. Right, right. Back as a, a, a water break, yeah. Yeah. Break water, yeah. Yeah. So that yeah. that's the really neat thing about that. Yeah. About yeah, that. we had, and then Terry DeVoe was out, and he had that, that uh, overhead view that he was looking at that looked as if that it might have extended out into – the, the shore over, you know, the road is, of course, yeah. put in there, but it looked like that might have extended out into the ocean a mm -hmm. ways, uh, thereby. And, and, and again, we've talked about the, I don't know anything other than what, like, Tom has shared with me about the tides there. Yeah. But, you know, knowing that, you know, the water levels were lower back then, um, you know, if, and that might have been dry ground at some point right there where that road was going out into the ocean a little ways anyway. A little ways out, yeah. Yeah, yeah we can't, we couldn't, we, unfortunately the rest of the road is under the swamp roads. So. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. To get a look but, at it. But again, the dating that, and again, we're going to have Dr. Spooner on uh, next week, mm -hmm. uh, next Saturday, and I'm going to ask him about that piece of wood. You know, they were up in the, the big platform that was on the north side of Nolan's Peninsula. He found that piece of wood it sandwiched between the rocks that was yeah. smashed, yeah. dated to about 1220 or so. Um, that just, just blows our mind, because our mind anyway, because who in the heck would have been doing that yeah. back then? Yeah, um, exactly. That, that just really 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 interesting to find that uh that type of a date and that, and it, it blows rick i mean marty away because he says quit giving me more dates to worry about here you know <laughs> <laughs> we have we have a lot of c14 dates floating around that's for yeah, sure exactly i know that's got to be uh um 
you know, just tear you up all the time because, you know, you, you want to find the, you know, the age of exploration or you want to narrow down on a particular time frame, and you can't because all the evidence just keeps coming in. Yeah. I mean, we're happy in the 1600s and then you get a date from the 1200s and yeah. it messes everything up. Um, so most, well, most of the stones okay. that we see used in different things, whether it's a pine turn, kill a hole, a well or a road, that all be local stones. There's nothing there that would be indicate that it would be like a ship's ballast stones or anything like that. No, um, I don't think we ever finished it. We were gonna get Ian to look at those stones in the Stone Road for that very reason. But as you know, it doesn't take long. It doesn't take much plowing to get a bunch of stones from <laughs> from no, the land. Pretty abundant. But they're not the stones in the stone road aren't uh, sea worn. They're not so they they're coming they're coming from the ground, not mm -hmm. from the shore. Right. Which is interesting. Or perhaps they could be ballast. Yeah. Yeah, very the, true. The uh, C four the carbon fourteen dating. Well, that yep. comes back with a with a range on it. Does that range very much or is, or is there some way that they can say, you know, within a certain level of accuracy? They do give you that. The really good ones will give you a give you a, a single date, plus or minus whatever, uh, which is very rare. Um, and I'm not a mathematician, but what you often get is you know 1675 to 1720, 56 percent, and that kind of thing. Uh, and you'll get three different range, at mm. least three different ranges with different percentages. So, which one? Do you I like the ones that just give you the boom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but there's so many variables, especially in the swamp. It's a free, if you know, it's a uh, not found in situ. It's kind of floating in the swamp. There's so many variables that it's a difficult, it's a difficult process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they've kind of said too that that you know, you know, Colin and Tom, you know, they've talked about the fact that there were a lot of shipwrecks in that area. And if that happens, that, you know, obviously these pieces of these ships are going to be floating and could very well get washed into the swamp. So some of what they're finding, the ship's piece of ship's rail or whatever, could simply be from a shipwreck and it floated in and got stuck in the muck and then found later by, you know, digging in there. That's, that's why we want to find things in the ground with a nice layer over it and also in association with other things that we can date. So the carbon-14 date just kind of... Uh, supports the other artifact center around it right but yeah it shouldn't be any uh surprise to find something from the 1600s floating in the swamp mm. right doesn't necessarily mean that it was originally in the swamp right mm. yeah yeah because that that anomaly that happened you know when they did the seismic testing in the swamp and then they went back and looked at the data mm. and they didn't have they keep talking about this 200 foot long you know it looks like a ship on its side type thing yeah. you know would it be great to pull up a ship out of there yes but they have found zero evidence of yeah. anything they drilled down there found no wood i mean yeah it's it's unlikely that there's a ship in there um yeah. You know, but and, and again, and then the pieces and parts they keep finding. Now, this year we noticed like, you know, uh, you know, one of my other co-hosts, Jack Campbell, you know, Jack and I really want this, this, this swamp, you know, dug up. I'd love to see the whole thing get <laughs> dug up to see what's down there, because I think there's more answers to the swamp. Yeah. But, but part of that, you know, problem, you know, like with the, the, um, the blue clay, you know, when they when they found it up there at the eye of the swamp and they were yeah. looking in there and Dr. Spooner, you know, he got in there and he's like, yep, looks like this was a blue clay mine. Well, that's where it was left. It was left <laughs> like that. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you got a ring of rocks down there. You got blue clay. What if the if it was a blue clay mine? Why is there still blue clay there? Yeah. What's your thoughts on the blue clay? Well, I, I mean, I like I love pottery, right? Mm -hmm. So, and work with someone on the island who has a lot of interest in that blue clay. Um, I think we'd like to, I'd like to get it, to get some samples of it. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have the samples fired so we can see what it would, how it would fire. Mm -hmm. But we're finding examples of what we call coarse earthenware, you know, redware, mm -hmm. uh, that we're going to be able to analyze this summer, do an elemental analysis. And really? it'd be interesting to compare that to the blue clay. Wow. 
um, mm. to see if maybe there was some pottery making on the island. We don't know of any, but right. that blue clay could have been a source for a pottery in the local area. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. And and if not, if you can do that type of analysis, you could also check soil in other areas of the province. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, do a comparative research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the other thing about the blue clay is we de we're definitely finding it in Smith's Cove. Um, so the L shaped structure was lined with blue clay. Uh, Billy's wall, I think, had blue clay on it. So they were using it um, mm -hmm. as a sealant. As a sealant. Yeah. So the question That's, then becomes where 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 were they getting it from? If if the blue clay mine at the center of this uh, eye of the swamp is still full of clay, they must be getting it from somewhere else, right? Yeah, which is I, I thought I thought Terry talked about deposits up near the money pit. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now is that is that something is blue clay found in the area? I mean Nova Scotia in the area. I mean, is that something that is found elsewhere besides Oak Island? That's a good question. That's the kind of research I'm just starting. Oh, okay. Um, but I know off Shelburne, where I grew up, there's a place called Blue Island, and it's, it was called Blue Island because of the clay. Ah, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So people did have did have claims on clay uh, around the province. Yeah. I keep wanting to say, of course, you know, again, the, 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 the swamp shaped like a triangle, the eye up there, just like you see on our dollar bill <laughs> down here in the States, you know, the eye of the swamp. Yeah. It's yeah. a plug. Pull that plug and see what's underneath <laughs> it, you know? And then when Ian and all, when they gave up on it and they went elsewhere, I'm just like, no, no, you got to pull the plug and see what's in there. Yeah. That's also, that's also another pretty protected area, though, isn't it, Larry? Yeah. Up Is that, that part of that cordoned off area? Even more so now, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Darn it. <laughs> they have to get that figured out. I tell you, that's yeah. Uh, oh boy, they're trying. <laughs> They'll yeah. get there. They'll yeah. get there. That red tape or blue clay tape takes some time. Yeah, yeah. Here's a question by uh, Darla. She asked this question: um, Do you have any advice for someone who is looking forward to volunteering on their first dig? Are there things that one should bring along? Um, that might not be so uh, obvious to a rookie. Bring along. Well, yeah. I think you'll notice we always tend to wear a hat and long sleeves and pants mm -hmm. because you're exposed to the elements a lot, especially depending mm -hmm. on where you're digging, uh, including the sun. Uh, knee pads are always good. I don't use them, but now my knees are terrible. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Knee pads are good. I tend to not work with gloves because uh, as you're troweling, you can feel the difference in the soil. Oh yeah. Uh, with your hands. Um, so if you don't want to look like a rookie, I wouldn't carry gloves. Uh, no. A trowel, of course. And a trowel. Yeah. Now there's special ones made for that. I mean, I have some trowels for concrete work, but now this is no. I mean, this is an archaeology trowel. Uh -huh. uh, Marshalltown, who's a big trowel maker, have specialty archaeology trowels. Hmm. The trowels I have now are handmade in Britain for archaeology. Oh wow! Um, are yeah, they Laird Niven, are they Laird Niven sing signature trowels? No. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Well, you're world, world famous now, so, you know, <laughs> you would think no. that, uh, yeah, you would have your own. But no, I mean, really what you need in archaeology is patience. Yeah. Um, you have to realize that, as Miriam said, negative evidence is evidence. So mm -hmm. if you're not finding something, you're still learning something. Yeah. It's just a lot more fun to find things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. The, uh, yeah, a, lot, a lot of the photographs we saw, especially on Smith's Cove, you've got this black and white stick yeah for yeah. scale what's yeah. the scale on that so that's it's every 10 centimeters so that was a 50 centimeter scale okay so each section would be 10 centimeters okay yeah, yeah. and i've replaced that with a smaller take apart one mm -hmm. now it's like the scale sitting over there it's i should mm -hmm. auction that's that i one. often wondered okay i see this yeah, stick and i go know. okay how big is that piece of timber and then yeah, okay, exactly. now i know <laughs> yeah it's generally it's generally 10 centimeters I know when I did work in, uh, I've all, I did a, a field school in Monticello in Virginia years ago. So Thomas Jefferson's house, 
And oh, wow. at that time, they were working in tenths of an inch when they were doing surveying. Yeah. And I was trying to point out to them that that you know the metric systems, you know, because they'd have to they'd work in tenths of an inch, but they'd have to convert it. They couldn't work directly from it. So now all archaeology in in this in North America is metric systems. No oh, one okay. is working um, in the imperial system. So. One of the questions that uh, Linda had brought up was asking about the McGinnis Foundation. Uh, she said, is the McGinnis Foundation that sits uh, sort of in front of the war room uh, actually where the homestead was? So that was kind of one of those. Uh, I didn't know the background on the McGinnis, mm -hmm. found, so-called McGinnis Foundation when we, uh, when we worked there. So I didn't do any of the background research. But it came out soon after we did the excavation in 2019 that it, so it was a house. Mm -hmm. um, there's a house, a barn, and a, and a, and a boathouse. It turns out it wasn't, didn't belong to Daniel McGinnis. Oh, wow. Yeah. He's on, he was on his original uh, settlement was on a different lot, I think 27 or 29 or something like that. Hmm. so yeah the the interest in that site's kind of waned i there. guess yeah yeah because we've got a picture i know that um um shannon public cover i think the somewhere <coughs> we've gotten some pictures yeah and there's one of them that looks at the um uh the war room and you can see the foundation in the foreground yeah um so we, we've got lots of pictures of when it was standing oh really okay yeah. Yeah, oh, so wow. we can tell exactly what it looked like. Okay, good deal. Um, there was uh, the bracket that was found. This was Brenda Dixon asked this question. The bracket that was found in the past week's episode that uh, when they found the 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 gun part, the uh, flintlock, right. they also found a triangle-shaped piece of like a bracket, like a hinge or something. Like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what was your – did you get a chance to look at that, and what was your opinion of it? I mean, I CT scanned it. Okay. Which just showed us that it had holes in it. It's a, it's a, I probably, I probably have, actually have one just over here. So, this is a large version. Oh, okay. Yeah. But this is what it was. Right? Okay. So just attached to the door swings like this. Mm -hmm. So this is exactly what it was, but on a much smaller scale. Right. Yeah. Now it seemed like it would to me. It seemed like it was too small to be for a fence or a, a gate or something like that. Maybe a gate, a small gate. What is it possible? It could have been for a box. Uh, could have been for a box. I tend to associate them more with architecture. Okay. So inside a house. Ah, okay. Possibly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it did have like the decorative, like the uh, well, it looked like it did, and yeah. I think Gary talked about it. I have like the a spade from a deck of cards, the spade on the, yeah. you know, that would make it a little bit, but not They're They're kind of common. Even today you can find stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's not an uncommon find. Yeah. Yeah. It could mm -hmm. have been for a door or a cupboard door. Or yeah. A small room or a pantry or. Exactly. Yeah. The, um, one of the, and that we're, uh, we'll get to, uh, some of the final questions here. Um, there was the the guys that came out, and I'm, I can't remember their names now, but they went out and they had the, um, the scanning yeah. equipment. The guy wore as a backpack, and he walked all around the island. Coast, um, coastal seabed research. There you go. CSR. Yeah. Now, are you are are they as are they really going to look into many of this the sites that they found? We see the 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 picture of the the island with all the little you know pink little areas on there. Yeah. Um, some that they were, you know, J uh, Jack kept calling the hatch, which I thought the hatch was, <clears throat> his map was actually a little bit further away from the center road. Yeah. Um, but there was one right there. I mean, are these all things that you're hoping to get to this season there? Yeah. You know, we, we kind of made a rookie mistake there because the one thing was a magnetometer, right? So mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's recording metal hits. Yeah, the island is full of metal junk, right? And it didn't occur to us to get rid of the metal junk first, like. Um, yeah. So a lot of the big hits are either wellheads, which we know about, uh, okay. or, or metal junk that we just didn't think to to remove. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we're, we're going back, we're doing it right now. We're getting um, Billy's guys to get rid of all of this metal junk. Mm -hmm. um, and Steve Guptill will record where it was. And I'm not sure if we'll be able to manipulate the data and, and kind of subtract the metal junk, or we might have to redo it. Um, get So get rid of that noise and redo it and, and actually get right. some good... Uh, yeah. good targets to look at that's a very good idea yeah, yeah. i hadn't thought of that either that's you're into it's interesting of course there would be there's times and then we know that <clears throat> not only uh, the data and this is something i was explaining on the show the other day is that there's so much of the data that is collected throughout a season or past seasons of the show that we just don't know about they didn't make yeah. the air yeah. Um, so we don't know about it here but you guys do know about it because obviously you're there working every day there's a lot of that data. There's a lot of finds mm -hmm. that never made the light of day for us yeah. also because it wasn't significant or whatever. A lot of times when they go see Carmen, now he's been coming to the island, yes. but before they would go see Carmen and they would show him one, we would see one thing that he looked at that they brought, but there's a, there's a Doug standing there with a, a handful of bags of all these <laughs> other things. <laughs> what about all those things? What, you know, what about, yeah. you know, so we know that happens. Um, so what what was one of your most surprising finds uh, besides the Mi'kmaq pottery, of course, that you kind of expected to find and finally did? What was one of your most exciting things that you think was found so far that has been aired? I know you've got to be careful with that, but uh, well, I'm not sure if it's it must have been aired. That would have been what are we uh, season eight? Nine just showed, yeah, yeah. Um, when we were working on the ball property and Alex was screening mm -hmm. and he found a button, a Royal Navy button. Yes. Yeah. Remember oh, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just had someone, he works at the, uh, he's a curator at the Maritime Museum, or sorry, at the Fisheries Museum. Mm -hmm. And they're putting together an exhibit of black loyalists and, and, uh, and, and their association with the sea. And he was asking me about significant artifacts. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, it's that commander's master's button found on the ball site. It's the second mm -hmm. one. There's the second one found. There was one found at Isaac's point. Oh, really? That Gary found. Yeah. Okay. But that guy was a high ranking officer. And also in charge, he was the person when you were going to load a boat, mm -hmm. he was the person in charge of loading the boat. Oh, so what was that person doing what what is that button doing on on samuel ball's property right and to me that ties together our interest with with the, the wharves that you mentioned mm -hmm. right that is almost a direct connection yeah right with those wharves so that was one of the most besides the u-shape u-shape structures what kind of cemented you know my belief that yeah there you go Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i knew i had it in here i had a picture of it somewhere i've got hundreds probably thousands of pictures that have been <laughs> going yeah. from the show um but yeah that was that was truly interesting because we are all wondering the same thing why would this be on samuel ball's property and the, the really cool thing that you don't see is that alex Lagina found it he mm -hmm. spent the evening off um researching it Oh wow! Yeah. So the next morning he came back, and we all said, "Yeah, we this is we know what this is." So. Yeah, truly, yeah. So that was that was a very interesting find. Great, that's yeah, uh, yeah fantastic stuff. Um, so tell us a little bit. Uh, I, you know, I'm sure that you've you know you're on the island every day, and like like Tom was questioning you or asking you about your season. Your season is much longer than you know. Then, like when the Laginas show up, they have to yeah. fly in and all this kind of stuff. You live in the area. Um, so knowing that, you know, I'm assuming you've already been out on the island and getting kind of getting things rolling for this season. But when does your year start, basically? When does it? Uh... Traditionally, we start early May. <clears throat> okay. And go to the end of November. Okay. That's our field season. Yeah. Yeah. We all missed it on how many caissons went in this year. Uh, you know, they said, well, we got money for four. And so we were all like, we had a little con or a little contest on here to see how many did people think. And I, Colin said one, I said two, and now there's a fifth one going in right now. It's like yeah. five was not an option. 
Yeah. I was only there. So I don't do, I was only there for one case on because Terry <laughs> couldn't be there. Wow. So I got to be up there for one, one case on, mm -hmm. but generally they keep me away from the money pit. Oh, do they? Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Cause they're going to find something that. and then you're going to show you and you go, Oh yeah. No, that's just a... <laughs> <laughs> you got to blow their bubble on there. You'll all be excited. So what, so, so what would a, what would a typical day look like for Laird Devon on Oak Island? Oh, good question. A typical day is me having planned out the whole day and then get there and production has a completely different idea. <laughs> that's usually what it is. <laughs> Or, or they say we're going to come film you, and I wasn't planning on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Makeup. Yeah, there you go for yeah. Steve's trailer to get makeup. Yeah. <laughs> we generally don't have prior knowledge to what they have planned. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, oftentimes, they'll just let us do what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, so I'll get called out somewhere, <clears throat> for example, or they'll um, – so I'll have to, you know, I have a Gary find that I have to go see. Um, or they'll come in and, and shoot what we're doing, which, which slows things down by half, probably yeah, I would imagine. more than that. <clears throat> um, and then it's a dynamic, uh, it's a dynamic site, right? So, you know, I could be doing something then all of a sudden, boom, uh, I have to go to Smith's Cove or I have to go see this. Um, it's very, very difficult to plan. Yeah. And I don't tend to find out until we get there in the morning. Right. So, Can you share a funny story with us? Got any, I'm sure you have a few. We've heard Gary is just a regular comedian. My favorite, my favorite Gary line was, so this was season, what, six, seven? When the coffer dam, we were waiting for the the permit for the coffer dam. They mm -hmm. wanted to, it was going to have to come out, and and there was a, <clears throat> we were sitting in the war room, and they were talking about the coffer dam. It's going to have to come out because there's going to be the stop start of lobster season, and they didn't want the sediment and and uh, to 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 um, spoil the lobsters. And, mm -hmm. and Gary piped up and said, "Did anyone check the contract to see if there was a lobster clause?" <laughs> claws oh yeah cute lobster claws yeah yeah <laughs> and things i mean it's a constant well he's a constant joke we're, we're constantly joking we're constantly yeah. riding steve guptal you know yeah i know he doesn't get sarcasm so yeah we're always very sarcastic <laughs> <laughs> well still like i said we've had steven he's been on with you before yeah. uh, on the show here we really do appreciate steven very much but it is kind of fun to, to poke fun uh, yeah. a little bit at steven it you know there was a just the, the last episode i think it was where uh, he was at the uh, the wash table and he was wearing he had like five layers of coats on yes and and so and he looked like the michelin man so i wanted so badly to jump out and show the picture and talk and i thought no i better not i've i've already ruined myself with steven enough as it goes already he's but got a duffel bag <laughs> full of winter clothes yeah. Yeah. uh he's yeah. the opposite of billy yeah, yeah. Oh, I know, right? Because we see Billy. Everybody else is all bundled up in coats, and he's wearing t-shirt and a short and shorts. Yeah, it's like, uh, yeah. I, his concession, you know, it's getting cold. He'll put a a jacket on, but still the shorts. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I I'm from the uh, Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and yeah. I know cold. Uh, that's where Rick and Marty are from, mm -hmm. and I I know cold and and uh, but yeah, you always run into those guys that are like, ah, yeah, cold. What's the matter with you? You know, and yeah. I'm like, I'm freezing over here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. But no, we have we have a lot of fun together. We have a lot of fun with. I, I remember my first impression was how how well the Laginas treated the crew, mm -hmm. you know, um, and so it's it's just we're just one big dysfunctional family, really. Yeah. That, that was neat for when Maddie, uh, Maddie Blake had done the uh, drilling down where we got to see behind the scenes. Yes. Um, and that was really a lot of fun for me anyway. I know and a lot of people, and that's one of my favorites um, because we did, we got to see so much more of what goes on on the yeah. island behind the scenes, the, 
Yeah. So even the caterer, you know, the person bringing the food out and right. food for you guys to all sit down in the picnic tables and eat yeah. every day. There's the things that we don't think about. We just see you working here, you working there, Gary working over here. Yeah. But there's a lot going on behind the scenes. And it was really a lot of fun to see that. And some of the, I mean, we, we've we always wanted to see, or I do anyway, I'd love to see a bloopers reel of, of uh, we know the show isn't scripted. You no. know, so they don't tell you what to say and all this kind of stuff. You may have to do something a second time, but we know it's not scripted. But there has to be a a lot of bloopers that happen, I would imagine. Oh, oh, I think there there's probably two seasons worth, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, season one of Rick falling in the in the swamp when he was trying to run across, and yeah, there was a scene of like one of the cameramen that was going down in the swamp, and he was trying to keep the camera up out of the water. It was yeah. 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 Oh no, there's a lot of that. And I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to take photographs behind the scenes and, and, and trying to get the crew and what I'll do with them. I don't know. You got to put it together. You'll have to share it at some point, you know, um, on, on the, uh, on your, on your Facebook page or something. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be fun to see. Oh yeah. No, it's, it's we enjoy it. We miss, uh, we miss being there. We miss yeah. being together. Yep. And you guys are friends off off the camera as well. I oh mean, yeah, we, we correspond. I correspond with Gary every day. Yep. And we correspond. Scott and Doug and <clears throat> Steve and I are all in a group where you know we're either making fun of each other or actually doing <laughs> work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that, and that you that shows, and that's one of the things that we love. I think that draws us all the two or three million people that love to watch the show. Yeah. That's part of what draws us into what you guys are doing there. Is it interesting? Yes. We all want to see something when you want Rick and Marty and you all to get the answers that you're looking for. Like I said earlier, would we love to see you pull up gold and our big treasure? Yes, we yeah. would. But I think getting those answers is so very important. Yeah. And I, I think people have to realize that we are genuine. I mean, uh, I'll get a call from, from Craig on a Sunday afternoon about some technical point, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it's not nine to five. It's, it's something that we're always thinking about. Yeah. Exactly. And not just us, that's Rick and Craig as well. Right? Yeah. Cause you know, Rick's never going to give up until he no. gets answers um, of all this, which is really cool. That's why we, you know, we're in this with you all watching the show through your eyes. You guys share this with us. And so we get to see what's happening. And that goes right along with you. Like we had a string there, unfortunately, of about four episodes that were kind of, you know, yeah. there wasn't a lot happening. Yeah. But we saw the disappointment uh, when they got done with can four. Mm -hmm. They saw number four and they were putting it in and you see their faces. I mean, that's it. I mean, that's genuine right yeah. there. Everybody oh, was just, for sure. you know, so. I I've often said to people, you know what, you're disappointed in, in what you saw on the show, maybe, or you didn't see what you, I should think what these guys feel like down there, mm -hmm. like yeah. they're, they're yeah. living this every day. And yeah. then all of a sudden it's, ah, it wasn't that. Yeah. And then production has to make something of that. Right. That's what people have to remember. And yeah. we, we're working on, Rick always says we're working on two levels. You've got the, the search level, <clears throat> or the search agenda, and then the production agenda. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and they, mm -hmm it's their job to make a product out of what sure. we give. Them. And people right. have to understand that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's, that's part of it is that like when they're starting a new can and everybody is all excited, we are too. All yeah. right. This is going to be the one that finds something and then it doesn't. Well, yeah, it was disappointing and you guys were disappointed as well. Um, and, but that's, that's part of this reality, reality mm -hmm. TV show is mm -hmm. taking us through those highs and those lows with you. Um, and that's that and the, and the funny stuff and uh, the dramatic yeah. stuff. I mean, again, going back to the drilling down, one of my favorite episodes is when Maddie was talking to Dave Blankenship about his father, yes. about the things that happened with Dan, Dave growing up and, and yeah. his accident and things like that. Emotional stuff. I mean, yeah. that's the yeah. kind of things we really need to know. I need to know. Yeah. Kind of put together in context of what's happening on the island and what has happened over the years. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're learning this because of the efforts of you and the team. And I can't thank you enough for that. And I can't thank you enough for coming on the show today. This has been, again, uh, you're always wonderful to come on and I, we appreciate, we know you're busy. You've got a life out there uh, <laughs> and, and you've got, you ride your bike to the Island every day or whatever, but 
you know, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to come on here with us and, and share like this. We're going to have you on again. I, we're going to ask you to at least Absolutely, as, uh, yeah. as things go along. And again, we're really hoping that um, you get to do some more looking, uh, you know, for um, with the trowel. We, yeah. we really hope the trial gets some use again uh, in season 10. We're hoping there is a season 10. We're assuming there's a season 10. So, but, Fingers uh, crossed. What's that? Fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed that there will be a season 10. Um, I was just looking uh, to see if Linda, let's see. Um, cause she, 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 I, this is my connection with, uh, they tell me to be quiet unless your guest speak, you know, cause I have a tendency to go on and on and on about stuff sometimes, but, uh, I'm, su I'm surprised Jeff, you haven't asked him if he's got any Maddie Blake moments. <laughs> yeah. Well, you do. You? <laughs> I didn't see Maddie Blake very much this year. Yeah. To be honest. He was on the Island quite a bit. Um, yeah. you know, they also it, had him run around doing uh, beyond Oak Island too. So yeah. yeah. See, they, yeah. they, uh, they operate as a separate unit, mm -hmm. you know, kind of, so we don't, we don't interact necessarily with them. Yeah. We saw, saw that one episode during the season when they had, um, uh, I think it was Joe Lessard was out on the Island. Yeah. Um, and they were actually talking about different things and, and showing us so kind of behind the scenes again. And there was one of the episode or one of the portion segments of that show where they were talking about what was being what was happening over joe's shoulder which was they were drilling uh there was one spot down um in front of the money pit by the shore mm -hmm. on the outside there um they were drilling down there and then there was a lot of stuff going on over by smith's cove that we haven't heard anything about yet um so but he mentioned about the the technology that was going to give us a big answers um which was that we're assuming that meant the muon technology that was going in and we thought, okay, this is going to be great. They even showed us how it works. One of the episodes mm -hmm. showed us how it works and the, the space particles going through space, yeah. going through the ground and all that and being detected, looking for voids and anomalies. We've heard nothing about it so far this year. You know, we got two episodes left and we've heard nothing. Um, it must be a data collection thing. Yeah, it is. It probably, you know, and who knows? I know you can't elaborate on that, but again, I, don't think they're hold, I just say they're not holding anything back from you. Okay. That way. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. It's a, a lot of fascinating things. And again, we really hope that you get back and get your trowel busy again uh, in season 10. Uh, Cause that is truly uh, a, a very interesting part of the show, I think. And again, it really, it, adds, it really adds to the story each week it to does. see a yeah. little bit more history. It really adds to it. It truly yeah, it, I mean, we're at a fight. We have to explain archaeology. We need to, to, to have the owners feel um, comfortable with us there. And the province is responsible for, they need to make them feel comfortable that if we find something, things aren't going to stop. Right. I know Helen, who worked with us, she's never been on a site that's shut down before. It's mm. never, ever happened. And she's in Ontario. Mm. She was in Ontario, where there are a lot more sites. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I, I hope we can get the archaeology back in and the politics out and mm. yeah. start doing our job. Yeah, we so do. do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we really do. Because that, as Tom said, it, it's such an important part of the history and a part of the show. Mm -hmm. um, you guys bring so much to the table and find so much more that's, you know, and we just, we, as the viewers of the show and fans of the show, we want, I want to know, I really do. I I'm on board with Rick a hundred percent to want to know, you know, who all was there and why were they there and why did they go through all the trouble to do the things that they did? So it, it's truly important. Yeah. And I think, I think we're showing the province too, that <clears throat> we work in tandem and cooperation with Gary, mm -hmm. the metal detecting is a good thing. I mean, it's used in other places in the world, right? Um, yeah. Why would they not want to use I don't, metal detectors? Yeah, I don't get that. It's, it's, it's from years ago, and they did the same with sport divers, like Tony. Um, they just are so hard on them. There's no give or take. There's no cooperation. Um, that They just kind of went to ground. They just The metal detectors and, and the, the uh, recreational divers just have nothing to do with the province. So if they find something, they don't report it. No. Right. In England, metal detector asks permission to go on land, um, detects if he finds something significant, they stop digging and they call in the local archaeologists. The archaeological dig takes place. 
a value is put on whatever they're found mm -hmm. and the money's split between the landowner and the de detectorist, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so detectorists want to go out and be careful and find things. Exactly. And, and that's yeah. how I think it needs to work here. Yeah. Yeah. Totally yeah. Agree. yeah. Yep. Yeah, we do too. For sure. It's, it's fun to watch Gary down on the beach and doing the things because anything found on the beach, you get to keep, you find it out in the water uh, from a shipwreck yeah. or something like that. You split it with the state or uh, yeah. uh, like the state of Florida or whatever. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but they do allow the metal detecting. It should be because yeah. you're finding now it being documented is important so that you know yeah. what's being found. That's, that's the important part of it. But my point this year is that he's finding things like that lock plate, that flintlock lock plate, that we'd never find right right, right. Not in a million years no no exactly and yeah. how important is that we think it's very important yeah because it's telling a history it's telling yeah. bits and pieces of that story of who exactly. was there and why yeah I mean, you don't want to lose that no so even well, before, if they had that even ahead. if the owner of that flintlock wasn't the originator of that flintlock it's still going to put a timetable on it mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep and it's just pretty cool yeah, it is very cool. Yeah, it's like the stone shot, you know, the stone yes. shot that they found. That that's that again. That's just so to me. It's so very interesting. And the cannon parts that were found. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's I just love all that stuff. And that, that's something that knowing, you know, watching the show and get dragging me into this now. I never had a, a interest in all of this before. I really do now. It, it's it's gone tenfold. Uh, yeah, it's wanting to get more information. It, it can bite you pretty hard. <laughs> yeah, it really has. Yeah. Yep. Well, before we wrap up today, I wanted to give you, uh, bring this up for anybody that's joined us late in the show. Um, I wanted to share this again, um, that uh, Laird is, uh, has a fundraiser going. It's the uh, BMO Ride for Cancer. Um, and this is the website. It is linked in our description below. Uh, so you can find the link there if you'd like to help uh, on this. Oh, there it's finally updated. Your yeah. goal is updated now. Yeah. I see that. That's good. <laughs> Um, so he's trying to raise money for this good cause. Um, and he has personal reasons for this. And mm -hmm. also, so if you, if it's something that you feel compelled to do, you can find the link in our Facebook page or, uh, Facebook page. Yes, it's definitely there as well. Yeah. Um, and also down below in the description, you can, uh, click on that and you can enter any amount that you'd like to do. Yeah. Every um, little bit helps. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. yeah, that's really a good cause. And we'd love to see that, uh, you, you definitely reach your goal there uh, for that. So. Oh, wow. This has been a great, uh, it's all what an hour and 45 minutes has been a fantastic Laird as always. And I, I can't thank you enough oh. uh, for coming on the show with us today and sharing some of your stories and, and what you're doing out there on the Island. And again, we really hope that we see more of you in, uh, uh, in season 10. Let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. Tom, you have anything else? No, I'm good. Thank all you. Right. Thank you very much, Laird, right. for, for joining us. My pleasure, for sure. Yeah. No, always a pleasure to have you on. And folks, thank you so much for being here with us today on the Curse of Oak Island and Beyond live stream. And if you're out there on the YouTube side, if you click on that subscribe button for us, we really appreciate it. If you like the content of our show today, give us a thumbs up. Those thumbs up really do help us to get this show out to more and more people on the YouTube platform. Um, and again, uh, just having Laird on has been a truly pleasure. And I that's part of the blessing that I've had with the, doing this show is to get to meet such wonderful people such as yourself such as, as yourself. And, and again, um, you know, spread the word to the other guys. I mean, we finally got Ian to come on next week. We got yeah. Steve Guptill and Ian coming on next week. We've been working on, uh, Doug and yeah. we've been working on, uh, uh <laughs> everybody, you know, everybody else to come on. And I know they're a little reluctant and we understand we're not going to get pushy about that kind of thing, no, but, absolutely. Uh, but it is fun to be able to have the different folks come on the show with Charles, you know, if we could yeah. ever have Charles, um, to come on and just share what some of the things that they know. It's it's always a fun and informative. Mm -hmm. and again, thank you so much. Thanks, folks, for being here with us. Uh, don't forget that we will be here on Saturday with again Steve uh, Stephen Guptel and uh, Doctor Ian Spooner. So that's going to be a fun show. Don't miss that one. And we got Scott Clark coming on. Tom and I are doing uh, going to have uh, uh, Ian and uh, and Steve. Steve. And then Alessandra will be here with me for Scott Clark. That's on Thursday, the 28th. So we got some really cool shows coming up. And again, thank you, Laird. You're Thanks, welcome. Laird. Thank All you right. very much. 
All right, see everybody, have a great rest of your week. We'll see you right here Wednesday um, at 7.30 for the Curse of Oak Island and Beyond, episode number 24 recap. Have a great rest of your weekend. Bye-bye now.